Hi, friends. It's Tim Viegas from Think Inclusive. Did you know that we've been hosting our podcast on Anchor by Spotify since 2018? And after over 80 episodes and 85,000 plays, I can't say enough about how it's the easiest way to have a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Anchor has the tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And when hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. From MCIE. If you follow education in the United States or Canada, you probably know about the movements by families, state agencies, and educators to move authentic inclusive education forward in schools or districts where learners with and without disabilities learn together and are supported. But you probably haven't heard about the Vishwas School in India or my guest, Kaval Singh. This is not a sight you would expect to see at just another school. Children with special needs walking hand in hand into a school with those who do not have any disability at all. But this is no ordinary school. This is a place where a big idea has evolved rapidly in a tiny space called Vishwas Kendra. The idea of philosophy is called inclusive education and that means every child irrespective of gender, social status or disability deserves equal opportunity. So at Vishwas, those with special needs share the same space and get the same facilities as every other child. My name is Tim Viegas from the Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education and you are listening to Think Inclusive, a show where with every conversation we try to build bridges between families, educators, and disability rights advocates to create a shared understanding of inclusive education and what inclusion looks like in the real world. You can learn more about who we are and what we do at mcie.org. For this episode, I speak with Kaval Singh, former director of the Vishwas School and author of Hanging On, a special educator's journey into inclusive education. Kaval and I reflect on her career working with students with disabilities in special schools and why her attitude changed toward inclusive practices. We discuss her experience as the director at Vishwas and what she's learned about sustaining inclusive education over the years and what teachers need to know if they want to keep inclusive education going in their school or district. Thank you so much for listening. And now, my interview with Kaval Singh. Kaval, nice to uh, nice to meet you over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here, Tim. And uh, I'm super excited to be here and a bit nervous too because I've never been on a podcast before. Oh, no problem. Yeah, we're going to make it really easy. You're already doing great. So, <laughs> no no worries there. Um so Kaval, I, I uh I I'm I'm really trying not to butcher your name. <laughs> Kaval. I'm not even sure how you got my contact information information. I think it was maybe over LinkedIn, but you've been emailing me <laughs> <laughs> for yes. like over a year and I'm so sorry for that I have took so long to read your book because I think that your book it mirrors a lot of the confusion about inclusive education here in the United States and so I think that that is something that seems universal is that inclusion is misunderstood whether it's the United States or Canada or India why don't you take a little bit of time and introduce yourself to our audience. They're mostly educators, mostly teachers and principals and administrators. We do have some parents and family members, but if you could introduce yourself and say your experience teaching and then, you know, when you wrote the book. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tim. So, um, I basically belong to New Delhi, which is the capital of India. 
and uh, that's where i've basically studied and that's where i've taught and that's where i've learned everything about inclusion and i joined the special education field in 1988 which is like this is my 34th year in the field so i'm very a veteran i suppose and uh, it's been a very exciting time a very exciting 34 years i mean it's been a very dynamic and action packed uh, period in the history of special education as you know because it was like full of twists and turns and highs and lows because it was during these 34 years that the field underwent lots of switches you know lots of reforms Mm-hmm. and uh, in philosophy as well as the educational setting so from special we went to integration and then we went to inclusion right and mm-hmm. when i started my career uh, it was in an ngo called uh, spastic society of northern india and uh, that time uh, i was very happy actually uh, i used to do my assessments using normal development milestones and i used to plan ieps and then we used to have end of term reviews and all so actually everybody was happy students were happy parents were happy because their children were in safe hands you know getting mm-hmm. all the education therapy everything in school and i was also very happy you know i felt very special you know i was protecting the children the students from this very cruel and very insensitive world and i was you know very happy but this happy feeling did not last very long because there was this nagging feeling you know that something is quite like not right and these six hours of school these six hours of special school were more like escaping from reality right it was like a make believe world where everything was perfect you know everything was like sunshine and rainbows and everything and what i felt was that the students were not only cut off from the rest of the world but we were actually overprotecting them we were overprogramming them i mean they were leading a very sheltered life a very what do you call it a checklisted life a timetable mm-hmm. life and then those questions started coming that what would happen to them when they became adults when they finished school when they reached 18 years you know would they remain in their homes for the rest of their life because they're so sheltered and they didn't know anything and who would look after them when the parents would get old and all so these were the questions that started coming to us in the organization and i think it was universal right and it was around 2000 you know that thing that that movement came about integration you know that children need to connect with the world you know you can't shelter them you can't segregate them and that's how the reform started the shift began and that was also the time when i was appointed as head of the special school so i was actively involved in this shift you know shifting out children from our special school to mainstream schools and of course uh, i think this was again a global phenomena that all, not all children qualified for integration it was only mm-hmm. those students who had you know the, that potential or uh, what do you call it readiness and they were identified and they were packed off they were sent off to mainstream schools and no support was expected from mainstream schools and it was basically up to the students you know you either sink or you either swim it, it it's totally up to you and i think it didn't make take much time to realize that putting the onus on students you know to cope and to adjust was not only unfair it was unrealistic so i saw the parents struggle i saw teachers struggle in special schools also in mainstream mm-hmm. schools also and of course the students struggled and many of them dropped out and many of them came back to special our special school so that was the situation around 2000 and then came inclusion around the same time and during this phase i was actively involved in the special education training course uh both lecturing and also modifying the course content and that's when actually my real problem started and that's where i you know i started questioning not the concept of inclusion but the content the course content what i was teaching in the postgraduate diploma because we introduced the theory of inclusive education 
but the practice is you know besides the first chapter everything else remained special so you talked about the inclusive education theory but then you again went back to special practices you know uh, mm-hmm. disabilities and characteristics and identification and special strategies for special disabilities and you know bridging the gap and normal and everything so so it didn't really make sense because you know something was there was something missing what we were handing over to the special educators to the students the trainees was basically an assortment you know a mishmash of theories and techniques and technical jargon so i wasn't comfortable with that so i started questioning myself and i started questioning in the organization but as you know that there are no answers and usually it's said that everything it's it's a process it will take time we'll see and as the years went by and we moved from special to in, inclusive education i realized how dysfunctional the profession was getting you know there were so many missing pieces in the puzzle you know all those gaps so many contradictions so many paradoxes and the is basically it's not even only the course that was a problem even the special schools i felt were in a mess we were not really practicing what we were preaching others you know the mainstream school we were talking about uh, inclusion but here in our special schools also even today what you will see is there are there is segregation within the special schools so uh, we have different streams so we have the academic stream we have the functional stream so even within a special school there was exclusion and segregation mm-hmm. based on cognitive abilities sometimes based on uh, physical abilities and all so then came a time when you know when even the the thought of inclusion or when i looked at the inclusive education vision on the board you know it no longer excited me i was actually after 20 years after two decades i i got fed up and you know i decided to take a break and i'm so glad that i decided to take a break because the next year that is 2009 i was offered a project to restructure an ex- existing school and turn it into an inclusive school not just in theory but you know in the true sense and i spent the next four years at this school which is called vishwas and these four years turned out to be the most challenging but the most productive and rewarding period in my career i would say and uh, i got the confidence that inclusive education is not easy but it is possible and of course it's tough but it's the right thing to do and that's what those four years taught me and after 25 years in the field and with hands on experience both in special and inclusive education that's when i decided to focus on writing so i wrote several articles in uh, some magazines and then of course came the book which is called hanging on a special educator's journey into inclusive education and as the name indicates it's about my journey uh, in the field and the book was published in 2020 so currently i'm working as a consultant with a very wonderful organization in the united kingdom it's called enet enabling education network and it's basically a global information and sharing network and it focuses on rights and uh, equity and inclusion of course and my current project is supporting some inclusive education program and teacher training programs in ethiopia and uganda so that's my 34 year journey in 5 minutes <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a fantastic job of summing it up <laughs> i thought that there's so many great insights in the book especially i'm remembering some um one cartoon in particular where you have a special education teacher and a mainstream education teacher or regular education mm-hmm. and they're kind of pointing at each other and saying no it like it's it's your responsibility mm-hmm. to teach the, the children you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh mm-hmm. and so something that something that we find a lot in the schools that we work with 
mm-hmm. in the United States is mm-hmm. there's a misunderstanding of roles and relationships with educators and students with disabilities. So when you were setting up this inclusive school, how did you work with educators to realize that special education teachers don't just work with students with disabilities and Mm -hmm. regular Mm -hmm. education teachers don't just work with typically Mm -hmm. developing children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, setting up the school was an amazing experience. And we spent a lot of time uh, on establishing the foundation, you know, for inclusive education. And that included a lot of work with the teachers. I think we spent, I think, 50% of the time, training teachers, sitting with them, mentoring, discussing, and everything. And when we set up the school, we basically removed the special tag. So it was about educators, not special educators. So it was about education and not special education. So that's Mm -hmm. one thing we did. So uh, it wasn't that special educators will go into the class and support the teacher or the mainstream teacher will take support from the special educator. So what we did was we just removed the tags and they were all teachers and it was a mix. So it any class teacher could be a special educator uh, by training or she could be a mainstream teacher. That did not matter. Right. So we basically simplified everything spent a lot of time in building the team and we basically created time and we created the space for ongoing support uh, sharing of experiences in service trainings you know all those sessions in the beginning the framework was very important we spent a lot of time doing that and the whole the idea and the whole the concept was that the starting point was all, which is all about inclusion, right? So it was mm-hmm. everything we did was all, the word all. It mm-hmm. was enrollment or admissions for all. It was plans for all. It wasn't IEPs for children with disabilities. It was lesson plans or uh, individual plans for all the children. It wasn't gross motor session. It was basically sports and games for all. It wasn't music therapy. It was music dance for all. You know, we didn't use terms like sensory garden or sensory stimulation. We were use general words like playground. You know, we stopped saying things like you know task analysis. We just said let's just teach in steps. Let's just break it down into steps instead of using the word collaboratively. You know, these words scare people, especially people who are, you know, already kind of, it's a new situation for them. So we work together, as simple as that. You're not saying things like, okay, we will do universal design for learning. Just, you know, used words like, okay, just make sure that we use different ways to teach the same concept. You know, don't stick to Blackboard and, uh, you know, job. Just, just use different ways. Just use pictures and this and that. So that helps in the teachers becoming very comfortable. That is fine. It's okay. That, so, that's like that is a great suggestion because we we just were having this conversation in our organization about labels. Mm-hmm. Um, we love to label things. So we label kids. We label our jobs. You know, mm-hmm. and but we also love to label frameworks, right? UDL, Absolutely. MTSS, uh, yes. I don't know, if, you know whatever, <laughs> all of yes. these different things. And you're right, they are really, they are, they can be very confusing, right? You said you've been involved with teacher preparation. So mm-hmm. what changes, uh, if any, have been made to, to help teachers understand what inclusion is before they get into the school system? So that actually is the problem. There is a big gap because the theory is all about inclusion. But once you get into the practice and the strategies, then it's actually somewhere you kind of switch or you continue doing the special bit. So that becomes an issue, right? So what I do is I kind of supplement, kind of, I just give, do my own take. That, okay, this is fine, but this is what you can kind of, how you can approach it differently. 
So that's, I mean, it's not part of a post content, but I make sure that I kind of sneak it. <laughs> I'm wondering in India, in your area, mm-hmm. when people graduate from you know, or get their teaching credentials, how, however that looks, mm-hmm. are there really inclusive schools for teachers to go to? Not at all. I can't think of a single uh, one. Yeah, so that's the problem. And actually, that's the reason why I wrote the book, because teacher training is very, very dear to me. It's dedicated to special educators. Yeah, it, it's for the te- it, It's about their struggle. It's really not my personal journey. It's the journey of many special educators. I wanted to ask you about your interpretation or, um, I guess, understanding of inclusive education, because I think that we're talking about the same thing, but why mm-hmm. don't you help me help us understand what you mean by inclusive education? I think all of us are aware of the systemic injustice and, you know, the divide, whether it's, I know that it's the same in the countries of the North or the rich countries. And it's exactly the same situation in the global South where people are discriminated against, they're excluded from society. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, that's a different matter. And a lot of us like to talk, you know, I want to make the world a better place. I want to make a difference. You know, it's that uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine. He sang about an inclusive world, right? Mm -hmm. A place that is free of poverty, a place that is free of discrimination and conflict. So inclusive education, according to my understanding, basically asks us to reimagine education, right? And education that is free from inequality and prejudice and segregation. And education that is not dictated by who you are or where you come from. You know, what language do you speak or how do you look or what you can do or what you can't do? So it's basically, so that is my understanding of inclusive education. And, you know, people often ask me that, okay, that all that is fine. You know, we want an inclusive world, but why do you want to make schools inclusive? Right? Why school? I mean, the world should be inclusive. Why do you want the schools to be inclusive? So I basically tell them that, well, schools are a reflection of society. And each Mm. school is like a mini representation of the world where students and parents and educators, they all come together, you know, from different backgrounds and experiences, different strengths and different struggles. So if you want an inclusive world, well, we need to start with schools. And building inclusive schools is actually one of the first steps towards building a an inclusive world, right? What I understand is mm. inclusive education is about belonging. And it's very easy to say that children should feel that they belong. But belonging is something you can sense, something that you're connected with everybody, you're part of something, right? And you can't force students to feel a sense of belonging by using techniques and strategies and other things. I think the key words are all and together. Mm. So if yeah. all students are together, all students learn together, all students face difficult situations together, you know, all of us find ways together. All of us solve problems together. So if you do the two things, all and together, belongingness automatically comes in. So you can't teach belongingness through a session or, you know, through some specific strategy. What would be your dream uh, of like where you'd want India to go with inclusive education? Well, my dream is that firstly, (laughs) we can start with the ministries, at least get them together (laughs) in the ministry (laughs) so that we start thinking of children as children and not disabled and non-disabled or children with disabilities. Uh, and all that so 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 my my dream is like whatever i shared that was you know all children studying together and so my mm-hmm. dream is what i want that that should be realized yeah <laughs> and then what would be your advice to 
um, special educators, whether they're in India or in the United States or in Canada or wherever they're they're teaching, if they want to be more inclusive, what what are some steps that um, they can they can take? Oh yeah. So if I look at special educators in India, I mean I have experience over here. So what I've seen is that again there is diversity. When we talk about children, there's diversity, and when I often talk about diversity in adults because people talk about diversity in students, but we sometimes forget to talk about the diversity in adults, whether it's teachers, parents, uh, special educators. So what I've seen is that not everyone has approached these switches and changes uniformly, right? So people have responded in different ways. So some educators just kind of fail through and, you know, like a breeze and just kind of imbibed inclusion and the values and some struggled. And uh, so for those who manage to adjust their sales, you know, kind of move, shift direction from special to inclusion. So I, I can just say congratulations, you've done well. And if you're struggling and if you, you're kind of stuck, so what you need to do is, what you need to understand is that if you want something different to happen, then you need to do things differently. <laughs> it's <laughs> as simple as that. So, And it's not about, you know, a lot of educators, special educators have moved to mainstream or regular schools, but they just transferred what they were doing over there to what they're doing in the mainstream. So that's just doing exactly the same thing, but just in a different setting. So basically, I want the special educators to understand that your thinking needs to change and your work needs to change. And somewhere you need to kind of address your, I would say, inner self. Like we often talk about inclusion as being a journey, right? It's a journey. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, of course, it's a journey where it's actually two journeys for everybody. So people don't talk about both the journeys. They just talk about, talk about one journey. So the first journey, the most important journey, which all special educators need to undertake is the inner journey. You know, reflect, take a hard long look, you know, at what they're mm -hmm. doing. Have an honest conversation with themselves. You know, I think somewhere you know, you can sense that what you're doing, is it making sense or not? Is it inclusive or not? Address all those feelings and address all those emotions, right? Address those belief systems. So that's what educators need to do, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, there's the outer journey, which is, you know, unlearning, relearning, learning new skills, updating knowledge, you know, modifying practices, you know? getting new material. So that's the outer journey. So what the educators need to do is first focus on your inner self. Take that inner journey first and you'll get a lot of answers for the outer journey because the outer journey becomes a little easier if you know, if you're comfortable inside. Right? Yeah. So that, that's yeah. one thing I would tell special educators to do. Another thing I would tell them is that please remove your the disability lens just just remove that lens because you get a very limited kind of a view i mean it's not easy but let's try to do it right and yeah and we educators also need to understand that they are not the experts yeah so that you don't control the child's the student's assessment and program you're part of a team inclusion means a team right it's that right. the, the collective yeah. thing. So please, I would say, take your hands off the steering wheel. You know, <laughs> stop controlling. <laughs> and so, so just, just, just be part of the team and do things together, and just remove that expert label also. Sometimes it's a pressure, you know, that you're the one who has to come up with all the solutions. Uh, so understand, yeah. understand that you don't. Those are great suggestions. Thank you so much. Will you let our audience know where they can follow 
your work? So my book is available only on Amazon India. So if you're interested, please contact me uh, via email or LinkedIn or Twitter. So I'm available on all the different platforms because that's what I used to promote the book because uh, it was released. It came into the world along with COVID actually. So Yeah. So that yeah, did it did. So I had to kind of it's... change my strategy. <laughs> So Kaval Singh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Think Inclusive podcast. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for having me. One last thing before I let you go. During our interview, I asked Kaval about whether the work she did at Vishwas was still going on and how we can make inclusive education sustainable. She said she wanted a little bit more time to think about it, and she would send me her response. Here it is. Before talking about the school, let me first talk about sustainability of inclusive education in general. Now, in order to be sustainable, inclusive education requires the support of three things. Actually, three pillars. I love talking about pillars. So the first pillar is the people all the stakeholders. The second pillar is the systems and the administrative structures. And the third pillar is the funding, the money. Now, inclusive education has some support of all the three pillars. It has people, it has systems, it has funding. But sadly, the support is available only in theory, on paper and on PowerPoint presentations. And the support has not really reached the learners, which is why schools are struggling to sustain inclusive education. So there have to be changes in the education system. You know, things like flexibility, diversity, differentiated learning. They will all have a real meaning only once there is a change in the rigid school systems. You know, the curriculum, the examinations, the one grade and one year norms. If you look at funding for inclusive education to sustain, the funding agencies and the donors have to align with the inclusive education ethos, you know, the inclusive education philosophy. You have to stop pressurizing organizations and institutions to follow exclusionary procedures in order to receive grants. So coming back to the Vishwas School and whether inclusive education was sustainable after I left, so the school was set up about 12 years ago in uh, 2010. And I think it was way ahead of its time, you know, radical and bold, doing away with all the special tags, the labels, you know, removing the disability lens and focusing on the learner's needs and pace rather than age and grade. I think it didn't really matter how innovative the ideas were, and it didn't really matter how beautifully inclusive the school had turned out to be. Because without the support of two pillars, which is the changes in education system and the inclusive funding, it was bound to hit a brick wall. And it did. So uh, let me give you some examples. So in order to get the school recognition by the state education board, Vishwas had to do away with the flexible, unique model, and it had to switch to the conventional one-year, one-grade model. So in order to receive grants and funding, uh, it had to start making separate lists and files, you know, segregating, categorizing children in, as disabled and non-disabled. And there have been several occasions where activities and events were dictated by the funding and deadlines rather than being dictated by the inclusive education vision. And yes, uh, this leadership definitely plays a crucial role in sustaining inclusive culture and practices. I'm well aware that some of the students are spending way too much time, maybe about 50% of the time, outside the mainstream classrooms, uh, something that would not have happened had I continued. I, I mean, we would have found ways. All that said, I'm happy. Actually, I'm very proud 
to add that in spite of all the obstacles, the school has managed to retain many of the inclusive education policies and practices. The focus on all students, all students attending and participating and learning very much continues. And when you enter the school premises, you can actually feel, feel the inclusive spirit and the culture. You can actually feel the belonging element. And you'll see students, disabled, non-disabled students laughing and running and playing together in the corridor. You'll see students who are disabled and non-disabled helping and supporting each other without being asked to do so by adults. You'll see students with disabilities having the space to breathe, you know, getting the opportunities to make choices, make mistakes, without special educators breathing down their necks. So I'm proud of all that. Even though I left eight years ago, I've remained closely connected with the school management. I've supported them, advised them whenever they've asked me to, and I'll continue to do so. And I also support the school indirectly by talking about the school, by sharing about the school, writing about it, wherever and whenever I get the opportunity. Think Inclusive is written, edited, and sound designed by Tim Viegas and is a production of MCIE. Original music by Miles Kredich. If you enjoyed today's episode, here are some ways that you can help our podcast grow. Share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. And if you haven't already, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Special thanks to our patrons, Melissa H., Veronica E., Sonia A., Pamela P., Mark C., Kathy B., Kathleen T., Jarrett T., Gabby M., Aaron P., and Paula W. for their support of Think Inclusive. For more information about inclusive education or to learn how MCIE can partner with you and your school or district, visit mcie.org. We will be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for your time and attention. And remember, inclusion always works. Thank you.